We encourage, if you will, tonight to take your Bibles and open them to Psalm 144. We want to look at verses 12 through 15 as the text for our lesson tonight. Psalm 144, verses 12 through 15. You may have seen a bumper sticker, or you may have seen a magnet on someone's refrigerator, or you may have seen somewhere the words posted, no whining. And I don't know about you, but I, I don't like whining. If you've got children, at least on occasion, you have some whining. That's just a part of having children, I'm afraid. And sometimes we as adults can also whine. We can complain and murmur about our lot in life. But there is an interesting prayer that is found in Psalm 144, beginning in verse 12, where David prays for a number of things, but one of the things that he prays for is that there will be no whining in the streets of Jerusalem. It is interesting that in the book of Lamentations, in Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 30, 39, that there Jeremiah records these words. Wherefore doth a living man complain? You know, if we really think about it tonight, if we have life and breath, why are we complaining? We certainly are in a better position than others. If we have food, if we have clothing, if we have shelter, why are we complaining? There are many people in the world that don't have those things, certainly do not have them to the abundance that we do, and yet we can complain about what we're going to have to eat tonight. We can complain because we don't have anything to put on, even though we have a closet full of clothes. We can complain because our house doesn't have enough storage, or our house doesn't have enough bedrooms, or in some other way doesn't meet our needs just our nature, it seems, to complain, to whine about what our lot is in life. And yet, there really ought to be no whining. There really ought to be no complaining if we truly take inventory of what we have, of what is ours. And so in Psalm 144, beginning in verse 12, David states this prayer. He says that our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth, that our daughters may be as cornerstones polished after the similitude of, or similitude of a palace. Verse 13. That our garners may be full, affording all manner of store. That our sheep may bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our streets. That our oxen may be strong to labor. That there be no breaking in, no going out that there be no complaining in our streets. Happy is that people that is in such a case. Yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. It's an interesting prayer. He prays for his sons to grow up strong like a plant. He prays for his daughters to be like stones that have been polished and made beautiful. He prays for an abundant harvest. He prays for his sheep and his oxen to bring forth. Prays for the oxen to be strong. For there in verse 14 to be no breaking in. Literally that one of the surrounding people will not invade their land. That there be no going out. That there be no carrying away into captivity. But in the midst of praying and asking for all of these things, he says that there be no complaining in our streets. You see, things haven't changed a great deal from the time of David. David's world was a world where people complained. Even though, if you know anything about David's time, and certainly the time that is to come, for Solomon's reign, it was a pretty prosperous time. There weren't a great number of problems. David fought wars. There were difficulties for sure. And yet people had food. People had clothing. People had shelter. People had the general necessities of life. And yet there was a great deal of complaining 
And so David, in his prayer, he begins to ask for all of these things. And one of the things that he asks for is that there won't be any complaining in the streets of Jerusalem. If we think about the background of this psalm, likely the background of this psalm involves Absalom, David's son, who was known for his beauty. But he was also known for his strife. He was known for the trouble that he brought to David's family. He was known for the difficulties that he produced in the kingdom for David. And the Bible records concerning Absalom in 2 Samuel chapter 15, in verses 1 through 6, that Absalom positioned himself in the gate. And when anyone was coming in with a complaint, with a controversy before the king, that Absalom would stop them there in the gate. And Absalom would, would ask where they were from. Absalom would make some conversation with them. Absalom would find out what their controversy or what their problem was. And then Absalom would say to them, there's no one appointed to deal with that. Oh, oh D David doesn't consider that to be a big enough problem to have anyone set aside to deal with it. You know, I wish I were king. I wish I was in that position because this is an important matter. And, and this is a matter that needs to be settled. And you're exactly right in what your thinking is. And you know, if, if I was king, then you might could have judgment or justice in the land. But yeah, as long as my father's on the throne, you won't find that with him. Here is Absalom. And Absalom, Absalom is fostering this complaining in the streets of Jerusalem. And in Psalm 55, David is going to say in verse 9 of that chapter uh, that he has heard, he has seen the violence and he's seen the strife in the seats. This did not escape the watchful eye of David. David knew it was taking place. David could have no doubt cut off much of the damage that was done to the kingdom had he only had the mind and the heart and the determination to do so. But Absalom was his son. And Absalom was far more forbearing, or David was far more forbearing with Absalom than what he should have been. And Absalom is going to steal away the hearts of the people. But that's the background of the criticism and the complaints that are on the streets of Jerusalem. Have you ever thought about what our world would be if we could remove whining from our world? Ever thought about what our nation would be if we could remove all the whiners? Well, there'd be much of news TV that would just go away, right? No whining, no complaining, no carrying on about all that's wrong. Well, political parties might disappear in and of themselves if we took away whining and complaining. People would be out of work and out of a job, but how much more peaceful our world would be. And David was longing for that kind of a society. Imagine a workplace where there's no whining or complaining. Some of you work in places where there's a great deal of office, a great deal of workplace strife. Where there's strife maybe between bosses, there's strife between bosses and workers, there's strife between co-workers. It's just a difficult place to be. Because people talk about one another, people uh, kind of push, push one another around and seeking to get the advantage. Imagine a workplace where there was no whining and no complaining and none of that strive. We have an example of that in Genesis chapter 13 in verses 7 and 8. It's an unusual workplace by our standards. There aren't cubicles that are set up. There are no desks. There are no computers. Nothing like that. But it was the workplace for Abraham. And it was the workplace for Lot. You see, they were herdsmen. And so their workplace was in the great outdoors. But they, they had their flocks next to one another. And there became some strife between the herdsmen of Abraham and the herdsmen of Lot. And Abraham said to Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between thy herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we be brethren. He says, We don't need this strife in our workplace. 
I don't, I don't, I don't need to dread coming to work every day. I, I don't need to have to deal with, with this as I'm trying to deal with taking care of these flocks and herds. You don't need to deal with this. This needs to be a complaining free zone. Let's get rid of it. Let's get rid of the strife. He gave Lot, of course, the choice and through that they were able to alleviate the strife. Imagine a home where there's no whining or complaining. Many homes where this dominates the home. Whining and complaining, unhappiness. Solomon talked about it in Proverbs chapter 17. Much of the problems within Solomon's home were of his own making, of course. Solomon multiplied wives. You cannot put 700 wives and 300 concubines together. And not have some strife. I imagine that's going to go with that. Solomon learned that. Proverbs 17 and verse 1, he says, Better is a dry morsel and quietness therewith than a house full of sacrifices with strife. He said, I'd rather just have a dry morsel to eat than I would to live in a house that's filled with sacrifices, literally filled with all of these things that have been killed and prepared and ready to eat. I would rather just have a dry crumb, a stale piece of bread, if you will, than, than to have all of these elaborate dishes if there's strife there. Solomon wanted a home that wasn't filled with strife. But his home wasn't like that. Think about other passages, Proverbs 19 and verse 13, Proverbs 21 and verse 9, Proverbs 21 and verse 19, among them, where Solomon talks about that it would be better to dwell in the corner of a rooftop than in a wide house with a contentious woman. Now, this is from Solomon's perspective. No doubt his wife had a perspective as well. And she might have said, I I want the rooftop, you can have the house, because usually those go hand in hand. It's interesting that on one time he talks about the corner of a rooftop, and you can imagine how big Solomon's house must have been. There was room to get away from people in Solomon's house. There there was room to, to spread out some in Solomon's house, and yet he said the rooftop and the corner of the rooftop. But on another occasion, he said it's better to dwell in the wilderness. Some, sometimes, at least in Solomon's way of thinking, the rooftop wasn't far enough away. Sometimes you needed to go out in the wilderness to get far enough away. Well, Solomon wanted a home that wasn't filled with complaining and strife and these kinds of difficulties. Imagine a congregation where there's no whining and no complaining. Now, Paul was longing for that kind of a congregation. He dealt with the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13. He dealt with the strife that existed among them. He wished that that strife wasn't there. In the book of Philippians, one of the best congregations with which Paul ever labored, and yet he talked about strife existing there. Some preach Christ of envying and strife, he says. Philippians chapter 1. In chapter 2, he says, let there be no strife or vain glory. Let each esteem other better than themselves. In Philippians 2 and verse 3. And then in Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, he talks about two women who need to be of the same mind. Evidently, there was strife that existed between those two women. And so, so Paul is asking for a congregation where there's no complaining, where there's no whining. Oh, what would it be like if we could take the whining out of society? If we could take whining out of the workplace? If we could take whining out of the home? If we could take whining out of the congregational setting? How much better would our world be? How do you do that, though? It's one thing to identify the problem and to dream about what it would be like for that not to be there, but, but how, how do you get rid of it? How do you fix it? That's the harder part of the equation for sure. But the Bible offers some answers to it. And interestingly, these answers come from, large part, they come from David and Solomon, from those who struggled with it. You know, sometimes when we struggle with things, it's where we find solutions to those things. 
The problems that come up in our lives are, are, are problems that we think about and we work on and we labor and eventually over time we figure out how to deal with them. And then hopefully we can pass that on to someone else so that they can avoid some of the problems that we've had. In the book of Psalms, the book of Proverbs especially is designed with that in mind. So- Solomon basically is saying, my home is filled with strife. But here's how you deal with it. David is saying, my kingdom is filled with strife, but, but here's how you deal with it. Abraham says, my workplace was full of strife, and here's, here's how I, I dealt with it. Paul's saying, here are these congregations with whom I worked, and they were filled with strife, and here's how I dealt with it. Trying to help us so that we can enjoy streets that aren't filled with strife. Pews that aren't filled with strive. Couches, if you will, that aren't filled with strive. Workplaces, free from that. Let's look at the answer to it. First of all, the answer is supplication. You know, prayer is the answer to so many things, and yet it seems to be one of the last things that we try when the Bible prescribes it as one of the first things to do, to pray. And when we talk about no whining and no complaining and getting that out of the workplace and out of society and out of the home and out of the congregation, that starts with prayer. That's how we deal with it. Consider some passages with me. Psalm 122 and verse 6, David writes these words, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. David saw strife on the streets of Jerusalem. Psalm 55 and verse 9. He was asking God in Psalm 144 and verse 14 to remove complaining from the streets. And then in this passage we read a praying for the peace of Jerusalem. David asked for these things and one of the things he asked for is that there wouldn't be any complaining. He he included that in his list of needs, his list of wants. And he asked God about it. In Jeremiah 29 and verse 7, Jeremiah says that we are to seek the peace of the city. And he's talking about the city where they're carried away captives. And he tells them to pray for that city. Now, if you were carried away as a captive, what might be the most likely, most obvious, natural response to that type of a situation? Would it not be to complain about your lot? To whine about... What's happened to you? And yet, when we read of those that were carried away captive, one of the things that that we, we see among those that the Bible lifts up as examples is that they didn't do that. They didn't whine and they didn't complain about it. Think about Daniel 1. Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, Daniel, carried away captive into a strange land. They're young men. They're they're at the point in their lives, no doubt, where they're contemplating getting married and beginning a family of their own and starting whatever they're occupied. They're at that point in life, and yet all of a sudden they get snatched away and they get carried away to a strange land. Joseph. Joseph was 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 at that point in his life and he got snatched away. There's the, the little maid that helps... Naaman now in 2 Kings 5, who at that point in her life gets snatched away. And yet she's going to help Naaman, who is the captain of the Syrian host that's carried her away. She's going to help him find a cure for his disease. Joseph is going to help Potiphar and ultimately Pharaoh to survive a famine. Daniel's going to help the king. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah are going to help the king that they serve. There's no whining. There's no complaining. How did they do that? It must have been what Jeremiah was talking about when Jeremiah says, pray to God for the peace of that place. For in its peace, he says, ye shall have peace. You see, when we pray like David did for there to be no complaining on the streets, we are the beneficiaries of that prayer. When that prayer is answered, then we enjoy the fruits of our prayers. 
Matthew chapter 7 and verses 7 and, 7 and 8 says, Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Ask, seek, knock. We understand the approach. Seek and ye shall find, the Bible says. You know what the Bible says about peace? It says it several times. It says it in the book of Psalms, the book that we're talking about, in Psalm 34 and verse 14, Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and ensue it. Seek peace. That's what David was doing. David was seeking peace. He was seeking for the situation in Jerusalem to be more peaceful. He's praying to that end. Now, there are many ways that we can seek peace. We might seek peace in the way that Matthew chapter 18 prescribes, where if there's a problem with a brother, we go and we talk to that brother. We try to work it out, whatever it is. That's seeking peace. But another way that we seek peace, and these are not substitutes one for another, they're just different things that we can do and ought to do in seeking peace, and that is to pray for that brother. To pray for the situation. The Bible says pray for those that despitefully use you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you. We pray for those folks, Matthew chapter 5. And in doing that, we enjoy peace that we otherwise would not have. James chapter 4 and verse 2 says you have not because you ask not. How many problems in congregations continue? How many problems in homes and workplaces and in society continue because those that can pray for peace aren't praying for it? Those that can ask for complaining and bitterness to be removed aren't asking for that. And as a result, they're not getting it. You have not because you ask not. Solomon, there is strife in his home. Solomon, what can he do about it? Well, I can pray about it. I can pray for complaining and strife to be removed from my home. I can pray for it to go away, as David did from his kingdom. We can pray. And prayer will help us to be in the right mindset, if nothing else. It will help us to tell God of our problems, if nothing else. But God has promised that if we will seek, we can find. But in the second place... How do we get rid of whining and complaining? Well, the second thing that is prescribed in Proverbs especially is the matter of separation. We have to separate from it. We have to stay away from it as best that we can. And this is prescribed over and over again. Consider Proverbs 17 and verse 14. The beginning of strife is as one who letteth out water. Therefore, leave off contention before it be meddled with. Leave it off. Literally, don't pick it up. Don't take it with you. Don't get involved in it. Don't meddle with it. You leave it alone. What happens with whining and complaining when you meddle with it? Well, it generally creates more whining and more complaining. I found that in raising children. You have too. If you allow the whining to go on and you acknowledge the whining and you get involved in the whining, it just increases. It's not the answer to it. You do your best to leave it alone. And that's what Solomon prescribes in this book. In Proverbs 17 and verse 19, He loveth transgression that loveth strife, and he that exalteth his gate seeketh destruction. He loveth transgression that loveth strife. I don't understand this, but there are people that love strife. They love it. That's why there's the National Enquirer. That's why there are the tabloids. That's why there are the television programs that, that stir up. Because people love strife. How many newspapers, how many magazines, how many things in society would go away if, if they couldn't generate strife? You see, the answer to it is to feel toward it the way that God feels about it. How does God feel about it? Romans chapter 12 says, Abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. If we would abhor murmuring and complaining and strife the way that God does, go away. If there are just enough that love it 
to keep it burning, to keep it going. Make no mistake about it. God despises it. He hates it. Some of the more severe judgments that God ever brought on His people in the Old Testament were brought on them because of this. Because they murmured. They murmured against Moses, murmured against Aaron, murmured ultimately against him, and God said enough. God did not tolerate it. It's one of the things listed in Proverbs chapter 6 that He hates. God hates this type of discord and strife. He doesn't want it. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 3 says, It is an honor for a man to cease from strife, but every fool will be a meddling. The honorable thing is to cease from it. The honorable thing is to avoid it, stay away from it. Don't meddle with it. That's the honorable thing to do. That's the right thing to do, the Bible says. That, that's, that's handling it the right way. As if to the best of your ability, you stay out of it. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 10 says, Cast out the scorner and contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. Cast out the scorner. It literally puts separation between you and the person who's complaining, the person who's whining, and it goes away. It certainly goes away as far as you're concerned because you get out of hearing distance of it. You're not a part of it anymore. And many times, and if you think about this even with children, if you can't hear them, it doesn't do any good for them to whine. It doesn't do anything. To, they, they may follow you, and they may be hard on your heels trying to make their case known to you, but the distance and separating from that, if it, you're not within hearing distance, the whining and the complaining won't work. We need to understand that as well in spiritual circles. Proverbs 26 and verse 17 says, He that passeth by and meddleth with strife, belonging not to him, is like one that taketh a dog by the ears. Notice, he that passeth by and meddleth with strife. Sometimes we can't avoid passing by it, but we can always avoid meddling with it. You're going to pass by some things. You're going to hear of some things from time to time. You're going to be made aware of some things. But at that point, you've got to determine, am I going to get in it? Am I going to get involved in it? Am I going to listen? Am I going to stir the pot? Or am I going to pass on by? I didn't go looking for it. It found me. But now what am I going to do? What's going to be my answer to it? And Solomon says... Don't meddle with it. Don't get involved in it. And, and notice the wording, belonging not to Him. Sometimes there are things that belong to you. Sometimes there's strife that belongs to you that you're a part of and you have to deal with. That's Matthew 18. You have to deal with it. You can't avoid it. You can't run away from it. It involves you and you have to deal with it. And, and let me say this. Don't pass it off for somebody else to deal with. If it is yours, you deal with it. Don't pass it off to somebody else. Don't say, this brother and I have a problem and so I want you to go help deal with this. No, no, you deal with it. You do your part in it. If it doesn't belong to you, then you stay out of it. But if it's yours, then deal with it. Don't pass it off for somebody else to deal with it. Don't make them handle your dirty work. You do it. You do the right thing regarding it. And Solomon talks about that. He says, but this is strife that doesn't belong to you. Don't get in it. Don't get involved in it. Let those that are involved in it deal with it. Taketh a dog by the ears. I love dogs, but I'm wary of dogs that I don't know. I've been bitten a time or two, and I, I'm wary of dogs that I don't know. And if it's a dog that I don't know, then I'm going to be extremely careful how I approach that dog, what kind of sudden movements I make. And I know enough, and you know enough, you don't reach down and grab him by the ear and pick him up. If you do, then you're asking for trouble, and if you get it, you don't have anyone to blame but yourself. Solomon says, here's a matter that doesn't belong to you. It isn't your matter. 
But you decide you're going to grab a hold of it. Solomon says wisdom would tell you not to do that. Wisdom would tell you you're going to suffer as a result of that. Don't do that. Stay out of it. But think about it as well. He says in Proverbs 26 and verses 20 and 21, Where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. So where there is no tail bearer, the strife ceaseth. As coals are to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. Now the idea is this. What happens to a coal if you separate it from other coals? That coal goes out. What happens to a fire if you don't put any wood on it? Eventually it will go out. But if you keep stoking the fire and you keep putting wood on the fire and you keep all the coals right there together, then they're just going to burn and burn and burn. So the answer is separation. Separate the coal. If you can separate yourself from it, then separate it. And that fire is going to go out. You're not going to stay in the middle of this. This is not going to continue to burn or to involve you because now you are a coal that's separated from the other coals that are so hot and 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 engulfed in this and flaming up with this, you're not there anymore. You're avoiding it. You're not putting any wood on it. You're not meddling with it. You're not involved in it. It will go out. Think about Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 33. And the pictures that Solomon give, gives us in this book are, are, are pictures, and, and, and Agur and others that give us in this book, are, are pictures that we ought to be able to understand. Notice this picture. Surely the churning of milk bringeth forth butter, and the, the wringing of the nose bringeth forth blood. So the forcing of wrath bringeth forth strife. You ever had a scab on your arm when you were a child, and you were picking at it, and your mom or your dad said, if you keep picking at that, you're going to make it bleed. You need to leave it alone. It'll get better if you'll leave it alone. Good advice, right? You keep picking at it, you're going to make it bleed. You keep picking at it, you're going to make it worse. It can't get well if you're doing that. Well, the same thing holds true with this matter of complaining and whining and strife. If you keep picking at it, if you keep forcing the issue, if you keep messing with it, then what's going to happen? It's going to make it worse. So separation, to the best of your ability, is the answer for it. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 4 talks about avoiding questions and strifes of words. We're at a point, it seems to me at least, we're at a point within our brotherhood to where question and answer sessions are almost a thing of the past. Because they have essentially become strife about words. They have become an opportunity for people who whine and complain and want a forum to take advantage of it. They're no longer serious questions designed for the purpose of learning truth. They're, they're now merely tools or objects used by those who have a bone to pick. And it's sad. We you think about the great question-answer sessions of days gone by with Brother Woods and Brother Elkins and by so many others that we've esteemed and have, we've learned a great deal from hearing them answer questions and yet we're almost to a point to where that's very hard to do in our environment. It's sad, but Paul was talking about that situation in his world. But one final thing that we have to do if we want to try to remove whining from the areas of our lives where it tends to pop up. And the third thing that he says is we have to exercise self-control. You know, we have to realize that we can't always control what other people do. And that frustrates me, and I'm sure it frustrates you. I can't always control what they do. But I can control what my response to it is. I can control what my involvement in it's going to be. And that's all you can control. Now, that's enough if we control that. 
Because if we control that, not only are we staying out of it, we're hopefully are setting the right example and maybe others will follow our example and also exercise the same self-control. That's the answer to it. Notice Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 18. A wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife. You've all heard the expression, it takes two to argue And that's true. You want to get strife out of the workplace. You want to get strife out of the home. You want to get strife out of the the congregation. Just determine, I'm not going to argue with you about it. If you want to sit down and we want to look at what the Bible says about it, we want to read some scriptures and see whether or not we're doing what the Bible tells us to do about it, then let's do that. But I'm not going to argue with you about it. It's not getting us anywhere. Probably not going to be any winners in that type of situation. Not the answer to it. The answer is for us to be slow to anger. Have you ever seen a situation that was escalating, that was just really, really getting out of control? And you've got the power to get it back under control. I've told you before the situation where I went in a Cracker Barrel one time, parked the car, went inside, and there was a guy behind me in line waiting for a table, and he was as mad as he could be with me. And I, I didn't know why in the world he was as upset with me as he was. And evidently, and I, I, to the, I've relived it in my mind many times, evidently I got his parking space. I never knew that I got it, but he let me know that I got it. And he was really, really, really mad. And I I tried to just say, I'm sorry, I I didn't realize it. I didn't mean to. Well, you could see that when I when I didn't come right back in the same spirit and tone that he did, that it kind of eased a little bit. Well, we go on in and get the table, and we're sitting down there. And guess who they seat right next to us? Just worked out that way. Now, what if I had come back, and and I I can do that. I'm I'm not saying I can't do that. I can. What if I had come back with the same spirit and tone and attitude that he had? Finally, okay, I'm getting away from him. I'm going. I'm sitting down. I'm going to have a good meal. And then, guess what? They plop him right down beside me. Now I'm paying for a meal that I can't enjoy. I'm pay, paying for a meal and I'm probably going to have an upset stomach because of all that's churning inside. But by the end, I don't remember, I guess it's probably Parker, I don't remember which child it was, but uh, he was playing with, with them by the time that the meal was over. And I thought, we've come a long way in the course of a meal, from wanting to fight, literally, to playing with your child by the end. But again, it's this idea of I can't control what other people are going to do. I can only control what I'm going to do. I I can't control what other people are going to say about me. I just control what I'm going to say about them. I can't control what attitude other people are going to have. I can just control my attitude. But if I'll do that, I stay out of trouble. And hopefully, I help to lessen the trouble that even they're going to get in. By responding in the way that I need to. Think about Proverbs 28 and verse 25. It says, He that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife, but he that putteth his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. A proud heart stirreth up strife. If I, if I tend to be proud about things, I'm probably going to make the situation worse. But if I'll be humble about them, if I'll take the humble approach, and if I'll approach it from the standpoint of, I'm, you know, I'm sorry, I don't want it to be this way. What can I do to make it right? Even if I think I'm in the right, even if I think that I'm justified in what I'm doing, if, if I'm willing to have that kind of spirit and that kind of attitude, and I'm willing to say, you know, I'm going to let God handle this. Vengeance belongs to Him. I'm going to let Him work out all the details, but, but I want Him to be merciful to me, and so I, I'm going to approach you with mercy. I'm going to approach you with humility because I know that God will abase the proud, But I know that God will give grace to the humble and I want grace. And so that's the way I'm going to approach this. That's the self-control we're talking about. And it's a hard, hard, hard thing. 
In Luke 22 and verse 24, we have the example with the disciples. And you know, the Bible says that there was strife among them concerning who would be the greatest. I don't know if you've ever thought about this or not, but here were those that spent over three years with Jesus. That they attended the most elite school that anyone could ever attend. They, they were disciples of the Prince of Peace. They were disciples of the one who dealt with people who hated him, who tried to catch him in his words, who did everything they could to make life hard on him, and yet he handled it every time the exactly right way to do it. They watched him. And yet they have a strife in their midst over who's going to be the greatest. So I should not be surprised when there is strife in... in Congregations where I'm there. I shouldn't be surprised that there's strife in my home from time to time. Solomon was given more wisdom than I'll ever have. And Solomon didn't always have the answers to everything that happened in his family either. Abraham father of the faithful. But still, there was this issue with Lot that had to be worked out. And there were other issues with the people around him, with his neighbors. There's going to be issues no matter who you are. Philippians 2 and verse 3 says, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but let each esteem other better than themselves. Again, there's this matter of self-control. I, I, I can't control how they think of themselves. And I can't control how they think about me. All I can control is how I think about myself and how I think about them. I can control that. And I can think about them. I can esteem them better than myself. I can put myself in my proper place. I can do all of that. And in doing all of that, maybe, maybe just maybe, some of these issues will be better than they otherwise would be. So I need to pray about it, first and foremost. I need to cast my burdens on Him, allow Him to have a part in it. He could solve things I could never solve. So I need to pray. I need to do my part in separating from it, make sure that I'm not involved in it, make sure that I'm not making it worse by being in it, by meddling with it, by talking about it, by listening to it, whatever it is, and then I need to make sure that I keep my attitude right, that I, I remain humble, that I, I, I don't get angry, that I, again, easier said than done. But what a prayer. What a prayer that there be no whining in the streets. I want you to think about, and I want to end up on this verse, Psalm 144 and verse 15. Happy is that people that is in such a case. Happy are the people that find themselves in that kind of a situation. Happy are people who find themselves in a situation where their sons are strong and their daughters are beautiful and their harvest is great and and their their sheep are many and their oxen are strong and there's nobody carrying them away and there's nobody invading their land. You know, that, that man is happy. That's happiness. Notice how he ends. He said, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. You know what he's really saying? He's really saying that's the way it's supposed to be when God is your God. That's the way it's supposed to be when you're His children. You know, when we think about that, when we think about the fact that's the way it's supposed to be in the church. That's the way it's supposed to be in the home of a Christian. That's the way it's supposed to be with the people in my circle at work, at least with my treatment of them. 
And that's the way it ought to be as far as my involvement in this society. Is that there'll be no complaining, there'll be no whining. I'll do my best to not be a part of that. Tonight, we invite you to obey the gospel. We invite you to become one of God's children. To be a part of a family that's unlike any other family in this world. Oh, there may be from time to time complaining and whining, but we know it's wrong and we try to make it right when we find it. Not all families try to do that, but this family does. And so it's great to be a part of, of a family that isn't perfect, certainly not on the human side, isn't perfect, but, but, it, but it's a family that's striving for perfection. It's a family that's trying to be what it needs to be. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Will you repent and turn away from every sin in your life? Confess Christ before men that He is the Son of God. Be immersed in water so that every sin can be taken away. Acts 22 and verse 16. Then as a child of God, be added to the church by the Lord. Be a part of His family. Do your best in that family to be what you need to be, to be faithful to His Word, to control what you do, to control what you say, to control what your attitude is. And then through that, to influence others to do the same. If it's the case tonight that you have strayed away from God, this is your opportunity to get your life with right with God. That's how it begins. That's how it spreads from that circle out to others that they too might do the same. Are you willing to humble yourself tonight? Are you willing to suffer wrong tonight to do right? We invite you to respond if you need to to the Lord's invitation as we stand.